Okay, we, good. Okay, we reconvene now for the second part uh, on the lecture about celestial amplitudes. It's a great pleasure to have Laura Donnet, and please, you can go. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, let me start by thanking all the organizers for the invitation to present this uh, review talk on this program uh, called Celestial Holography or Celestial Amplitudes or Celestial Conformal Field Theory. So as you will see, my approach will be um, quite uh, orthogonal to the one that um, Emilio presented as I have a background more coming from gravity and so-called asymptotic symmetries for gravitational theories. So um, I will take this, this point of view to attack this program. As Emilio said, there are many, many different ways to, uh, to address this question and it, uh, it actually combines different kinds of communities. So my talk will be uh, from the asymptotic symmetry perspective. Um, so let me maybe try to give a second round of motivation for uh, this program that is called Celestial Holography very quickly. So, so let me emphasize that so we want to uh, aim at a holographic description of quantum gravity in four-dimensional uh, space-time, which have vanishing cosmological constant, or in other words, are asymptotically flat. I will uh, define more precisely what this means. But uh, I think uh, the motivation for doing so is pretty obvious because these uh, kind of space-time are describing basically the real world. Um, of course, we know we live in a space-time with a desider space-time with a positive cosmological constant, but uh, for a huge amount of applications, uh, uh, taking lambda to zero is a very excellent approximation uh, for scales that are smaller than cosmological scales. Um, and of course, we would like to understand whether this uh, beautiful principle called uh, the holographic principle uh, holds beyond the canonical cases uh, given by the uh, beautiful uh, results given by the anti decider conformal field theory correspondence. Um, and indeed, if holography is a, you know, it's not the mere curiosity of, of, of negative cosmological constant space times, it should hold uh, no matter the value of lambda. And this is uh, what I guess the the, the faith that we have that this principle is very generic and is a fundamental principle of, 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 of nature. So, um, so having this in mind, let me say that the case of a negative cosmological constant for ADS is very different from the case we're interested in because the, the boundary of ADS space-time is a time-like boundary um, while, uh, in contrast, I will review this Penrose diagram for Minkowski's place briefly, but the important thing to notice, and, and no one should never <laughs> underestimate this, this, this thing, because this is what is the, at the root of difficulty of actually uh, building a holographic principle for flat space-time, is that the boundary as you can see in this Penrose diagram, is this um, uh, line here spanned by this retarded time u, and the boundary of flat space-time is a null or light-like hypersurface. And this apparent innocent tilt of 45 degrees is actually at the root of the, uh, of the complications of, of uh, providing a holographic principle for, for flat space-times as actually there is no natural notion of uh, time evolution in flat space. And um, there are many ways to act attack this problem. It's a difficult one. And um, I guess that the, the, the new feature about celestial holography uh, compared to previous attempts to, uh, to flat space holography is that is it put really the, the symmetries uh, front and center in the program. So, um, the guiding principle, and this is what I want to emphasize on to the, today. So this is the thing we'll follow. Symmetries. 
symmetry principles. Um, so the very first question we should answer before even attempt to, to, to provide this uh, holographic uh, setup is to answer the question, what are the symmetries of asymptotically flat spacetimes? And this question, this apparently simple question, has uh, provoked a lot of, um, of uh, debate in the community, starting from the very first advent of, uh, of um, general relativity and gravitational wave um, papers. And still today, I cannot give you the full answer. So this, this actually is still under development. But at least we have a partial answer to this question, and already this partial answer is actually uh, giving us some very rich structure that I will try to, to explain. So um, this is the first part of the talk. So I will review uh, what are these asymptotically flat spacetimes and the so-called bondi mesner zak symmetries that are associated uh, to it. So if there is no uh, question, I will start right away. And Please feel free to interrupt me at any, any moment. OK. So, assembly flat space time. So, let me start by um, writing down um, very simply a first Minkowski metric so that we, we start really from square one here. And now let me, let me do a change of coordinates where I will use this retarded time and also I will ch uh, change the usual angle coordinates to these uh, stereographic complex coordinates Z and Z bar. So if I made this change very simple change. Then the line element for this is just exactly Minkowski f flat space time. So this is Minkowski in 4D. Then I will map Minkowski line element to the following expression, where this gamma ZZ bar is just what happens to the round sphere metric written in this complex, complex coordinates. So this is just Minkowski metric, uh, exactly flat space time, but this is a bit boring. There is nothing much going on for these space times. Um, so let me write this. Uh, no, let me leave it like that. Now what I would want to consider, so OK, um, maybe I, want, I, I can briefly recall what is the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space. So uh, the space has been compactified, but the causal structure being preserved. And um, when what happens when you take, um, so this is time, and this is the radial coordinates, when you, uh, so these, the important thing about this coordinate u is that uh, it labels outgoing null hypersurfaces. And in this Penrose diagram, all massless particles uh, travel along line of 45 degrees. And the location where all masses particle end is this boundary here, which is spined by this coordinate u. So you take r go to infinity, keeping all other coordinate constant, and you land on this null hypersurface, which is called, denoted by this letter scry, scry plus, it's called future uh, null infinity. Um, so you have an analogous boundary here, which is past null infinity. Um, and uh, each point here in this diagram is a, is a two-sphere, actually. It's a, it's a hemisphere that is mapped between these, uh, these axes of symmetry here. Um, but um, the important thing is that the, the topology of the future boundary is so in a real line spined by u times a two sphere, and this is the so called celestial sphere, and the, the coordinates on the sphere 
are the are just the, the, the angles uh, here taken to be this complex variable z and z bar. Uh, on the other hand, a, ma a massless, a massive particle uh, starts from um, past uh, time like infinity and exit space time like that. So this is a, a massive particle, while a, a massless particle and its life at square plus. And here in this talk, and as Emilia did, we'll be interested mostly in uh, scattering of uh, massless particles. But analogous uh, for celestial amplitude holds for a massive, massive scattering. So um, this is, this is uh, the space-time we, we have at hand. Now we want to define a, a space-time which deviates from Minkowski metric by a certain um, amount, which is dictated by the so-called boundary conditions for the metric field. And this will define, so this is what uh, these people study general relativity did in the 60s. They provide us with a very nice set of uh, coordinate system and gauge fixing, which is allow us to describe in a very uh, natural way outgoing radiation. So let me emphasize that the whole motivation for that is actually was actually in the 60s to understand the status of gravitational waves, because at that time it was not clear whether they were uh, an artifact of of the theory of, of general relativity or whether they were actual genuine physical uh, uh, processes happening. And this is this is what motivated the following uh, work and results that I'm going to talk about. So now an asymptotically flat space-time. In first approximation is a flat space-time. So it starts exactly like Minkowski space. But there are some correction as you, uh, going, you are going far away from the, from the source, so as you take r to infinity, there are some corrections which are um, given in terms of uh, 1 over r expansion. And the deviation from Minkowski space, I, I cannot use colors, it takes the following form. So where I will define what are this function here. Um, and now I realize that I was not smart enough to leave some space, but let me try. I hope you can read. So, again, to emphasize, I'm just writing how the metric field deviates from the Minkowski metric. And um, all this part, so you see I'm, I'm picking Z and, uh, ZZ here, but there is analogous term for DU, DZ bar, and so on and so forth. So I'm writing plus complex conjugate. And then there are some other terms which uh, fall off with a higher power in, uh, in, in 1 over r. So the important thing to notice here is that, they, as you can see, there are here some functions. So that I will try to explain what, what they mean. I hope you can read it. So the first um, first function here that I call M is an arbitrary function of the retarded time and the angle, which that is called the boundary mass aspect. So, roughly speaking, it encodes the energy of the system you are describing. So, if you take, for instance, a black hole, a curved black hole, you write it in this. Uh, coordinate system, in this case, you can see that this boundary mass aspect will just be given, will just be a constant, it will just be the mass of the curved black hole, for instance. But in principle, you could have a, um, a more generic function than that. And similarly, this nz here 
Um, it's called the angular momentum aspect because it has to do with the angular momentum on the space-time. And there is also an nz bar that I'm not writing that is included in this uh, z uh, complex conjugate terms. And finally, uh, this function c here, which is also an arbitrary function of u and the angle, is, is the asymptotic shear. So there are many things one could say about this, this, uh, these objects. But let me just emphasize uh, just a few points. So uh, the probably the most important one is that um, the time derivative of this, uh, of this function here is called the new tensor. And it's very important because it describes precisely the fact that there is an outgoing uh, radiation. Um, and there is a, a very uh, beautiful formula that, that Bondi uh, uh, derived. So when you integrate on the celestial sphere, the mass aspect, you see that uh, this function the time evolution of the Bondi mass. So let me write xA as to denote z and z bar. Basically, this quantity, because of this uh, sign here, is, is always um, negative. So wh what does it mean? It just means that, you see, you have um, a system, and the system is emitting gravitational uh, waves, the waves propagate through space-time and exit at as cry plus at fraternal infinity. So you have uh, gravitational radiation uh, leaking out uh, the system, and this causes a decrease of the mass, which is very uh, logical. So it, this is the so-called Bondi mass loss formula. Laura, can yes. I ask you one thing? Yes. So here, it seems that you fixed the radial dependence, right, like of your uh, your deviation, right? You singled out the coordinate r. Would you have allowed for another, like for another radial dependence, for instance, for a weaker falloff? Oh, other falloff, yeah. So yes, exactly. So there are many uh, things hidden in this expression. So the first one is actually I'm fixing a gauge. I didn't mention that, but you see there is no grr. There is no dr square uh, component, for instance. There is no uh, GRZ neither, so I have a gauge fixing at hand here. This is actually one of the nice things about this, this work is that it provides you a very nice gauge fixing to actually single out the, the, the interesting uh, feature. And the second is, um, is what you are asking, basically uh, who is telling me that this is the right fall of condition? Why, why shouldn't, you know, shouldn't I look at uh, a more generic fall, uh, fall off uh, for the fields. And this is a very, uh, in general, very complicated and tricky question. Uh, the choice of boundary conditions that you may want to impose because related to that you might have... <coughs> so it's always, you know, a, a, a very um, complicated balance between being generic enough so that you encode interesting solutions. In this case, the, the very nice thing about this uh, fall off behavior, so power in our behavior, is that it includes the presence of gravitational radiation. Um, but you might think of relaxing these this, uh, boundary conditions, and this is what people are actively actually trying to do in the, in the modern literature, because typically you might find more symmetries and more observable, so probably this bondi messner zak fall off condition were somehow too constraining to some extent. There is a rich story about how the symmetry gets enhanced in these cases. I, w I might say some comments, but indeed it's a very uh, natural question to, 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 to ask. It's a very subtle thing to do. Okay. So, um, that's what it means to be an asymptotically flat space-time. And, um, good in the, in the sense of Bondi-Mesner-Zax. 
And so, and these results were very important because they were, uh, you know, if you want the theoretical proof that uh, gravitational wave exists and are not just a mere artifact of 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 uh, of the of the theory. Uh, good. So. Let me uh, now move to, uh, to the symmetries, the so-called infinite dimensional symmetries of flat space-time, which go under the name of bondi messner zachs or for short, BMS symmetries. And this will uh, nicely connect with uh, all this story about uh, soft theorems that Emilio uh, presented earlier this afternoon. for the so-called uh, asymptotic symmetries. So they will be generated uh, generated by, so this would be generator. They will be generated in infinitesimally by, by a vector field. And the rules of the game that you are playing is that you want this vector field uh, to be such that when you act on it on the space time, so you take a lead derivative uh, acting on this space time, what you can do is you can modify the function here, the bond mass aspect, the angular momentum mass taken the shear, but you cannot mess up with the parts in R that I've written uh, down. So when you, you, when you uh, follow these two rules, what you land on is, is on the following expression. Um, so this is a so-called asymptotic killing vector field. Sorry. You find the following expression uh, where this function F here has two pieces. Okay, so I speak under the uh, some experts in the room, so correct me if I'm writing something wrong. Um, and so the important thing to notice is that let's focus here on this on this uh, thing here what did I, that I wrote T. The important thing about this function is that it's an arbitrary function. I could have called it uh, alpha or whatever. Uh, try function of, of the angle. And because precisely it, it can be, it can take any value on the, on the Celsius sphere, um, you, you have an infinite amount of these, uh, of these symmetries. And, and this T generates what is called super translations on the, on the celestial sphere. So indeed, you can see that it appears in this d by du here, but instead of shifting uh, by a, a mere constant that you, you would usually do, uh, you would have four usual Poincaré translation. Now you're allowed to change, to shift this uh, by a, an arbitrary function. So you have an infinite amount of, 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 uh, of shifting the, um, on this direction, and this is why um, this BMS symmetry is actually an infinite dimensional extension of the Poincaré group. So w the surprising discovery of BMS is that, and, and then I will talk about the why, uh, just as. Because basically there is, because of the presence of a boundary, the Poincaré is actually enhanced, so it's an example, uh, one of the first example of symmetry enhancement. You might be familiar with the symmetry enhancement is say, um, the boundary of ADS3 is given by two copies of VR0, so you can see that the group can be infinite dimensional. And this is probably uh, one of the first historical examples uh, where um, the asymptotic symmetric group is an infinite dimensional extension called the BMS group. Uh, which spans uh, su uh, uh, super translation. And this function y here, uh, this vector field y here, um, so basically there are uh, different uh, choices in the literature for which that's what Kara was asking me, what, what, what kind of boundary condition you, you, might, you might want to impose. 
So this YA is actually a co should be a conformal uh, killing vector on the sphere. If you choose this, if you ask for this uh, vector field to be globally well defined the sphere, then you will just uh, find the, uh, the Rhodes group. But if you allow uh, for local singularities, so basically you are violating <laughs> BMS, but at some just at some isolated point, then um, you can allow for what is called the super rotations, um, and this is something we are used to see in. Uh, in, uh, in CFT2 because basically now uh, this would be now uh, local, so CKV, local uh, conformal killing vector fields, and these two uh, things will uh, span uh, a Vera Zorro, uh, Vera Zorro, two commuting copies of the Vera Zorro. So some people call the BMS group just the uh, infinite uh, dimensional extension of translation to super translation. Some people mean that they allow for, for the virus or symmetry, and so people have an even uh, an another definition of what it means it means to be asymptotically flat, but I don't want to go into too much uh, details about that. The important thing to note is is that we have enhanced the four usual tra pro uh, translation of Poincaré to an infinitesimal super translation, and similarly, the, the Lorentz group can be enhanced to an infinite amount of uh, super rotations. And these symmetries, um, BMS symmetries, are the symmetry explanation for this beautiful uh, universal theorem that Emilio introduced. Is there any question about, about that? If not, I, I wanted to just make a sort of uh, a sort of um, chart that you know that is um, recapping uh, all the all this all this story. Uh, okay, this is what I'm doing now. So we have these asymptotic symmetries. So each each symmetry will be responsible for uh, one. Um, so let me write this uh, here. That this we'll call that super super rotations. Okay. So I didn't say, but the the BMS uh, symmetry span. An algebra called the BMS algebra, uh, given by two copies of the Razoro, spanned by y and y bar, and, and and the super translation commute with themselves, but don't commute with uh, super um, rotation. They form an ide uh, ideal, I, I, abelian ideal of the of the group. So um, we have this. So okay, what's the what is the relation? Uh, with what um, Emilio told us earlier. So I will consider uh, spin two field, uh, linear perturba uh, perturbation of, of Minkowski uh, that I call H. And I will look at the angular components of that. So, um, the leading part in the perturbation is given by this gravitational shear, uh, whose derivative is the presence of, indicates the presence of gravitational radiation. And um, basically, the, let's look first at a super translation symmetry. So, as I said, they are. Um, given by these vector fields. T. 
You can actually compute how these symm symmetries act. I told you that you are allowed when you act on the symmetry to change this function here, m, c, and n. And when you look at the action of, on, of the symmetry on the gravitational uh, shear, you can see that actually it includes an uh, inhomogeneous piece, which amounts to shift the gravitational shear by a quantity given by basically uh, the covariant derivative associated to the sphere squared um, induced by this arbitrary function of the angle uh, t. And um, this has a very nice interpretation in terms of the so-called uh, memory effects in, in gravitational wave physics uh, that I unfortunately don't have much time to, to talk about, but if you have any questions, just, just let me know. The connection I, I want to emphasize, is the one that Emilio already uh, uh, mentioned, is the one with uh, wire identity and soft theorems. So the statement is that the wire identity associated to this symmetry is nothing but um, Weinberg uh, leading soft graviton theorem. So this connection was uh, found by Andy Strominger and collaborators I guess, yeah, t eight or around eight years ago. And as Emilio said, so the, the leading uh, of Graviton theorem has a pole that goes like one over the energy of the, of the graviton, which is taken to be uh, soft. So there is really a neat statement. It's not an analogy, it's really like, if you take, you <laughs> if you take the wire identity, which involves the charge associated, to the another charge associated to the symmetry, uh, in a, and and see its implication on the scattering uh, amplitude. Um, you land literally written in different language, but you 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 are exactly describing the same physics as Weinberg did in the 16s for a totally from a totally different uh, perspective. So. This is quite a very deep thing because it's really connecting two uh, seemingly uh, disparate topics. The one people working in GR in the 60s in their room and, and uh, QFT people working in a different room uh, and finding this, this, this theorem. Um, and the beautiful thing is that you can go further than that and actually re-express uh, these, these things in terms of uh, the so-called currents, as Emilio mentioned. So these are uh, two-dimensional. Yes, is there a question? Just, just to understand yes. the very naive question. So if you just take the word identity of Poincaré, you will not get the leadings of Graviton theorem. You really need the, the full, right? Do I, did I understood correctly? Yes, basically, um, you will have to allow for uh, function t that 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 uh, that that span basically more than the usual ones it also span the the full uh, and also you 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 also need so this is something that i didn't quite get into the details but you need also to know carefully how to connect the super translation symmetry at the future boundary of minkowski space as cry plus and at the past this is done through this so-called antipodal matching condition, which is related these this symmetries. But you also need uh, uh, to do that. And this is basically why I think these connections were not totally clear, is because you, know, you needed to first uh, relate these two things. Uh. If, I, if I only impose Poincaré, what would I get that doesn't work? That is not, uh, that is not that is violating the soft graviton theorem. So, basically, you would not see it because you would need to allow for function <laughs> which are such that uh, the dz bar of them gives you a delta function, <laughs> more or less. So, so this, this, you, you know, you, you see he presented, as he presented uh, before, uh, like um, you have this, um, basically, the, the, the pole that in the, Okay, the form of the uh, sub, uh, leading subgraviton theorem involves this, this power of, of 1 over um, z minus zi. 
And to really see that this is induced by some symmetry, you will need to allow for a symmetry parameter that is actually uh, having a this form. And this is uh, not the case for a, a globally well-defined uh, super translation. Uh, translation. So that's how you would you would see it, or you would not see it <laughs> more precisely. Sorry, yes. I have a question. Uh, usually, in uh, scattering amplitude, uh, soft theorems uh, come from uh, some spontaneous symmetry breaking. For instance, in the QCD, you have the Adler zero that comes from some broken shift symmetry. Is there in, an interpretation uh, of these soft theorems in terms of uh, some spontaneous symmetry breaking? Yes. So uh, sometimes people uh, use this phrasing in this context um, by saying that there is a sort of symmetry, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking um, induced by this uh, shift here in, the, in this function. Um, I guess the, 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 the name is a little bit, you know, maybe the name is not, uh, it's, it's a little bit an abuse of language, but, but there is a sense in which you start from a given, um, so this, this symmetry acts in such a way that, also people phrase in the following terms, they say that the vacuum in gravity is, is degenerate because if you start with pure Minkowski and act on it with these symmetries, you see you start with Minkowski as m equals zero, c equals n equals zero, you will turn on a non-zero shear here. So, and this will still um, be a vacuum of your theory somehow, but if you want this implanted by soft uh, symmetries, um, but somehow, sometimes people phrase this uh, wired identity as some uh, imprint of, or of some, yeah, of, as the imprint of the fact that the vacuum is degen degenerate in the Minkowski, and that you can jump from one Minkowski vacuum to another by acting with the translation. Since you have an infinite amount of that, you have an infinite amount of vacuum. Yeah, Thanks. Vacua. one curiosity. So if you act with the super translation, so you say that you modify this C Z Z. Do you also modify the other functions or yes. So, so they, they have uh, yeah each symmetry change uh, they change everything in a well controlled way. Uh, I'm just not writing the expression. They can get very messy and complicated but but yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, good. And okay, so that's that's that that's how it works. And uh, not maybe surprisingly, now that you you see how this chart is organized, the super rotation symmetry symmetries um, spined by um, well, let me write it like that. <coughs> uh, they have a, a different, um, slightly different action on, on the shear that I'm writing here. Now there is three covariant derivative um, now involving the vector field, so which is taking to be a holomorphic vector field, and this the wide identity of that, as I think Emilio said, is the subleading subgraviton theorem, which. Uh, now involves uh, not a pole, but goes like omega to the power zero. And there is an analogous uh, story for for gauge theory, where I will focus, I will expand the z component of the gauge field, uh, saying that it starts with a, a function, a cons uh, constant in r plus something that goes like one over r. And someone was asking, Earlier, he, he changed seeds, but uh, the, 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 the asymptotic symmetry associated now to the leading uh, soft photon theorem, so which is again one of our omega, is now induced by what people sometimes call large gauge transformation. where you can recognize the action of a gauge transformation parameterized by a f um, an epsilon here. 
So that's if you want the symmetry interpretation. In, in the, in the gauge theory side, uh, this, this, this understanding of things after asymptotic symmetry is somehow a little bit less intuitive, but the gravity case, at least for me, but uh, there isn't really a one-to-one -one, uh, analogy between all these, these things. And as Emilio said, so this, um, this war identity can be understood as the insertion of a U1 Katchmoody current on the celestial sphere. So um, uh, let me adopt some, some notations so that uh, this is fully uh, clear and not too heavy. So as, as Emilio said, the, the operator on the celestial sphere are labeled by uh, a conformal dimension delta. So delta. In conformal theory, we often write this as the sum of uh, left and right uh, weights, H and, a, a H and H bar. And there would be a, also a spin that I think you, you wrote S, which is given by the difference of these two things. So sometimes I will write it in terms of delta, sometimes in terms of H and H bar. I hope it will not lead to, to confusion. So uh, an operator on the uh, celestial theory, uh, so let's say the operator number k will be labeled by some conformal dimension that, that, is, that are coming from the Mellin transform of their non-momenta, as Emilio explained, uh, and the point z and z bar uh, on the celestial sphere. So from, so from the bulk perspective, you have a massless uh, particle propagating through space-time. It enters from square minus, it exits as square plus. Every time it uh, uh, enters or exits the, the boundary, it pierces the, the, the sphere, the asymptotic sphere, at a given point z and z bar. Um, and their energy is related, is mapped more precisely in this Mellin transform uh, integral to the conformal dimension delta. Um, so the, the, the way that the soft photon theorem is induced on the, or expressed, if you want, in the celestial picture is by the insertion of this current that I call J. And Sorry, I have a very naive question. Yes, is there any bound on the maximal dimension that these operators can have in such a way that they don't back react on the, the geometry? A bound on? On, on the dimension, because I guess at a certain point, if they're too heavy, they should back react to the geometry and like deform it somehow. If you think it like in usual ADS-CFT thing, more or less like... Yeah, so... Is there any bound on the... On the, de on the delta? Yeah, on the dimension. Any implicit bound on this or there can so, be any... Yeah. So in principle, when you do this Mellin transform, all delta, even complex delta, are allowed. Now, certain values of delta will co correspond to a different kind of perturbation you're actually doing to right, the exactly. geometry. So, uh, exactly. So, uh, typically, the well-behaved one, if you want, the one that correspond to normalizable wave packets, are, have delta equal to 1. This is actually the one lying on the principal series. Uh, but you might want, and actually we do want, and this I will talk about that uh, soon, you want also to allow for uh, different kind of perturbations where the delta will not lie on the principal series and will... Yeah, but the question is more or less is like, like, is there a maximum value for which my approximation is like just radiation going in Minkowski is fine or then I should worry about some... You know, they, if it's radiation, it should contribute to an energy momentum tensor, then it starts deforming the background and the geometry changes. It's not more anymore Minkowski. So that's my naive, very Yeah, naive yeah. it will be worse and worse. Right, exactly. So exactly. maybe in the Mellin transform, there should maybe, I don't know, some sign of a kind of a upper bound for delta that allows you to have... So I think from the, from the Mellin transform, nothing is... Well, okay, the, the, uh, up to, okay, yeah, conversion of integrals. Right. But you also want to uh, probably have some uh, physical insights about uh, what kind of perturbation you want to... Actually, I think it's still under discussion. I see. To okay. some extent, uh, wh what is what is the <laughs> the perturbation you want right. to allow? Okay. How far we want to go? Is related to the kind of fall of conditions you want to impose. All this is tied together. 
Okay, thank you. So this is just a notation for the operator on the celestial sphere. So if you have a correlators involving n operators, um, so you write this in the Mellin, Mellin basis or the boost uh, eigen basis, which diagonalize precisely the action of uh, Lawrence. Um, then you find the leading soft photon theorem. Is it a, oh no, I thought someone was knocking on the table. So this, in, in Austria, they all, they all do that, so I'm just as confused. <laughs> so um, good. Uh, so this is uh, the current that is uh, secretly encoding celestial, uh, that is encoding a theorem in the celestial picture. So I think Emilio already wrote uh, this expression. And now for uh, the super translation story, you have, a, you have this weird guy that, that Emilio talked about reviewing it in the light of these symmetries, because now we can interpret this object as the natural current that you will get just uh, by, um, by the effect of, of, of translation symmetry. Um, an insertion of this uh, current, uh, quote-unquote, give you the give you the uh, leading soft photon theorem. So now I should be careful because ah, ah, I don't have uh, enough uh, space here. But I want, what I want to emphasize is that is the thing that Emilio said that I hope you can read. So he already told you that the effect of this uh, celestial current is to shift uh, the conformal dimension by one, if you remember what you said earlier. And here is exactly what I'm writing. I'm saying that insertion of this P shifts H and H bar of the operator number K by one half each, which according to this is precisely shifting delta by one. So you can see that delta goes to delta plus one. And this is... Uh, <laughs> one of the ugly feature or, or nice or new feature, depending on how you want to, to see it, of celestial conformal field theory, is that the presence of super translation symmetry is forcing you to, um, to consider theories which obey these, uh, these uh, sort of correlation function or, or, uh, on the celestial sphere. And of course, uh, this kind of action is pretty uh, not so natural from the, from the usual uh, CFT perspective. But as you can see, this is, this is what we have to deal with it. With. There is no way around it. If you kill these things, you do what BMS tried to do in the 60s, namely, you kill super translation symmetry, and basically, you will uh, reduce to Poincaré, but you will also kill all sort of gravitational radiation. So you don't want, you don't want to, to, to do that. And so uh, we are spending a lot of effort trying to understand how super translation, what are the full implications of uh, super translation symmetries from a would-be uh, conformal field theory uh, point of view. On the other hand, the uh, super rotation are more natural from the CFT perspective because they are basically just Virazor symmetries, and this we are very used to deal with in, uh, in CFT2. And uh, in this case, there is a nice object. You can even build a you can even build it from the gravity solution space, something that is playing the role of a stress tensor. Why? Why I, I'm allowed to call it like way, that way is because it satisfies the war identity of a, the Viorzo war identity of a stress tensor in a CFT, which I'm writing here. I'm trying to write it nicely because this is pretty packed. I hope you can read. Okay. 
So this is again, this is not a mere analogy. You can really build an object, which I call T, which is such that its insertion into a correlation function on the celestial sphere, thanks to this Malin transform, is diagonalizing uh, the thing well in the sense that it gives you uh, precisely the wire identity of a, of a stress tensor. There is, of course, a T, T bar of Z bar, which gives you the anti-holomorphic version of that. But now we can understand these things as associated to the, to the super rotation or various or symmetries. <coughs> So I don't want to um, write so many technical details about how you can construct explicitly this uh, these, uh, celestial current. There is actually a very rich uh, story be, be beyond, beyond that. Um, let me maybe do this so people can see. Let me just... Um, try to make connection with what Emilio said. So how can you get these things? Um, well, uh, these 2D currents of uh, celestial uh, CFTs, also called CCFT, uh, arise from uh, taking um, some taking the conformal dimension to take some integer values, and this is what uh, people refer to as a conformally soft limit. Because you see, if you remember what 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 Emilio said, you have this um, this Malin transform, which is exchanging the energy of the particle for the delta, and we knew what it meant to be soft in the usual energy momentum basis. It was to take omega to zero, but now in the celestial basis or holographic basis, whatever you want to call it, the Malin basis, then as he said, this amounts to actually uh, take integer values uh, of, of, of delta and pick, pick this. Uh, this um, so you have this. Uh, super, let me focus on. And you have the, that. Um, yeah, no, let me. Yeah. The fact that the super is actually a current is obtained not merely by taking delta to one, but taking the limit delta goes to one of uh, the derivative of of a celestial operator, so it, in a sense, it's a descendant of um, of, of an operator which has. Uh, so it descends from from an object that has delta equal one and s equal one. Oh, I removed the. Um, so because s is two and. So I have delta equal one and S is spin two. Uh, you can see uh, H and H bar. So delta equal one and S equal one corresponds to H equal uh, three half and H bar equal minus a half. But now, since I'm taking uh, the dz bar of, of, of this guy, so the dz bar of such a as of such an object will will raise the power will raise the the h bar by one unit. So you will land on um, 
So this guy uh, at the end has a three half minus a half plus a half coming from this dz, here, dz bar here. So it's, it has weights three half plus one half. So you see that we call it a current, but uh, you know, it's not a current in the usual sense, in the sense that the U1 catch money current has weights uh, 1 comma 0, the stress sensor is a 2 comma 0. This guy is a 3 half, 1 half. But again, we, we have to include this guy, and it provides actually a strong constraint on the, on the dual conform, uh, celestial conformal field theory. And um, let me uh, say a word which I think is in importance of understanding some subtleties and open question about um, uh, celestial CFTs, which is the fact that the, the stress tensor um, involves this, um, this shadow transform, which is actually a pretty funny thing to, funny thing to, to understand from the gravity uh, perspective. But so now we'll be looking at delta egg wall. Well, precisely, I don't want to write it, so it will be confusing. So we, wa we want to look at the, the stress tensor. And in terms of this Mellin transform operator, it involves this, this integral on the angles of a spin two or here minus two, I'm taking a negative helicity um, operator. So I will take the conformalist of limit delta goes to zero, but I, I'm also doing this integral. And this integral is a shadow transform Of a, of, a, of a primary with weights delta equals zero. So in, in, in general, let me just write um, what is the, the shadow transform because it's, it's, if, if you open any paper on celestial holography, you will see a lot of discussion about shadow transform and light ray transform because basically because Many amplitudes, once, once you Mellin transform them, will give you a contact terms, will give you a delta function. And the shadow transform of, of a delta function will give you a power law in, in 1 over z. So, and so it's taming, if you want, a shadow transform is taming some singularities that you, you have some, kinematic, some kinematic singularities in low point uh, functions. That's why um, um, the shadow transform is actually interesting. So a shadow transform, so if you start with the with uh, primary of conform by dimension delta and spin j, this is the definition uh, according to the reference is Osborne of a shadow transform in two dimension. It's just some integral on the on the on the, um, on the on the sphere, um, and you land on the new primary, but now which has a different weight, so it has a con it it's flip as you see it fi flips the spin. You start a spin j, it gives you a minus j spin, and it changes the dimension delta to a dimension two minus delta. In d dimension, it would give you d minus delta. And um, as you can see, if you take delta equal zero in this formula, and I'm sorry that this is uh, spin s. I wrote it s before. Sorry, spin s. Emilio, this is your fault. You changed. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm joking. <laughs> it's spin. Um, spin s, so if you take delta equal 0 and s equal minus 2, this integral reduces to that. So you can see that this is really the shadow transform of a, of a, pri of a delta equal to 0 uh, primary on the, on the celestial sphere. 
So this uh, gives you uh, naturally something that has a wage, as you can check easily. So it's really a, a, a well-defined 2,0 current on the, on, the, on, the, on the celestial sphere. Um, is there any question on, on this uh, conformally stuff? So, so the, the, the important point is to mention, to recall that we have this soft sector. This soft sector are encoded by asymptotic symmetries, which are infinite dimensional. Um, they can be nicely interpreted in terms of currents, which was not trivial the idea of like, you know, in flat space time, we could actually build 2D uh, object that really obeys the identity of currents on the, on the celestial sphere. You can do it. The, the part associated to rotation is nicely and naturally encoding to a stress tensor, but the part with, uh, associated to support translation is more difficult to interpret from the usual uh, CFT perspective. But the nice thing is that any theory which is dual to 40 gravity in flat space time should obey this constraint. So there is no way. So whatever theory one might come up with, it has to obey these constraints. So these are an infinite amount, actually several infinite amount of constraints, and this is very powerful. So and there is no way around around that. So that's what we are hoping to, you know, come with more and more constraints and just build. Uh, build a theory uh, uh, like that. And on the way, uh, we are uh, understanding uh, to which extent flat space holography is uh, analogous or not to ADS holography. Uh, I have a few comments to, to make uh, that goes in different direction, and then I, will, I, I want to maybe give a sort of conclusion and outlook uh, so that I don't think there is point to enter into more technicality, so basically uh, that, 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 uh, that will be it for, for the technical stuff. Let me know if there is something that is not clear or if you have some comments. Okay. So, what can I tell you more? We make some generic comments on that, and then I'm trying to give you some overview of where the program is and what are the important things we need to achieve and what people are thinking of. So um, let me just mention that that these currents uh, can be naturally related to, uh, to the gravitational solution space, which was written before in terms of this, uh, in terms of these uh, shear and use and everything that defines uh, an assembly flat space time, in terms of, uh, so-called BMS fluxes, and this is um, something we worked out with Romain uh, Rudziconi, who, who gave a, a gong show um, on Monday. So these fluxes are just, uh, you see, you, the integra in integrated uh, version of this quantity over the old uh, future boundary. And by definition, this is, uh, yeah, this is the difference um, of these things at scry plus plus and scry plus minus. So scry plus is the future null infinity. Now the future, so when you take u equal plus infinity, you land at the future of the of future null infinity called scry plus plus, and at the past boundary you have what is called a uh, scry plus minus. And all these currents can be neatly interpreted in terms of things that transform nicely as primaries if you look at uh, this integrated uh, U integral and these uh, BMS fluxes. Let me, let me comment on some recent development in the literature 
uh, due mostly to Strominger, Guevara, and Mujpet, um, another, which is the fact that you may actually consider an infinite tower of current. So I, I told you about this delta equal one and delta equal zero and its shadow. But there are actually um, some hints that there are an infinite tower of such currents uh, which corresponds which correspond to, um, if you want more uh, subleading pieces into the gravitational expansion. Um, and in recent papers, um, it was shown that this infinite uh, tower of currents could be actually repackaged in a very simple form in terms of what is called a W1 plus infinity algebra, which is a uh, um, the algebra that appears in higher spin theories. So a lot of people were pretty excited about that. So, so far the analysis, I uh, have to say that it's only include all, all positive gravitons, so it has not, the full analysis has not been uh, carried out for, um, in generic cases, and also we know that they are, we have more than currents, we can also take this shadow transform, so there are many uh, more things we want to, to, uh, to, to, to look at. So basically now the, I would say that the classification of all uh, currents which have a non-trivial action on the celestial uh, CFT is not known. So we, we have a partial leaf of them, we have a few of them, uh, but not all of them, and you know, how these objects are related to each other, to which to which extent these, these objects give you new insight or give you the same information but repackaged in a different way. This is still uh, not clear. This has to do with also what Emilio discussed. What is the spectrum of operator? What is the right basis? Uh, do we want to stay on the principal series? Well, probably not, because the stress tensor lies outside the principal series. Do we want shadow operators, shadow operators? These are uh, people are looking actively at uh, right now. So I guess I will um, try to make some uh, conclusion and some outlook about a list of things that we uh, want, we might want to do in this in this program. So that there will be some uh, some time for question and probably people are very tired after all these uh, talks. <laughs> So, can I ask you one, one thing more? Uh, because I think I missed this thing. What is like these BMS fluxes? Do they have any, any physical interpretation, like in terms of the. Uh, oh, yes. Solutions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I, mean, I missed yeah. that, sorry. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Um, so, basically, the flux is the flux of out, outgoing radiation. So, so re it's gravitational radiation. Exactly. So, there is nothing I would say l l less physical than that. Actually, uh, you know, um, it is something that I didn't talk about, but the physical uh, manifestation of these symmetries is this gravitational wave memory effect, which is uh, supposed to uh, measure at LIGO in the up upcoming years or decades. It's not clear exactly. Or LIGO or LIGO are another uh, experimental setup. It's a very subtle effect, uh, but roughly speaking, this, this effect is a is um, encoded into a permanent displacement of the position of detectors long after the gravitational wave has, has, has passed. So, you know, we often hear that space, uh, gravitational waves squeeze and uh, stretch space-time, but what we never hear is that they permanently do so. Namely, they, they will not settle back, they will oscillate, but then they will settle back uh, in a position which is uh, permanently different from what uh, they started from. So. This is something that has been known from GR people from the, from the, starting from the 70s and 80s and 90s. And now there has been some uh, basically uh, more um, enthusiasm in that. And I think it's very exciting because even the memory effect is nothing but the input of super symmetry. And it's nothing but, uh, you know, somehow uh, also the measuring, if you want, if that makes sense. Uh, the, the measurable uh, 
way of uh, looking at uh, Weinberg's of, of theorem. So, and this flux is basically to go back to your question is um, is in, in particular encode the flux of outgoing radiation. So. Uh, that is escaping through the system, and then you know you are here and uh, with your det detector, and you will really see the burst of gravitational wave passing through. Maybe another question. Yes. Uh, in light of the symmetry that we have uh, in shifts of delta, uh, do you have an intuition why the tower of current stops at plus one and not goes and doesn't go at delta equal two, three, four? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this is um, this is uh, this is to be expected. That actually, it's just the, the statement is that this proof of Storminger and so on was carried out for that. But when you allow for shadow transform, basically you will also allow for um, for or the other tower and stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, make some uh, some co conclusion and uh, an outlook, maybe. So the, the conclusion, the thing that I think are more important to, to remember is that the infrared structure of gravity and in general of, of gauge theory, here I focus on gravity because it's what I like most, but you have an ergo story for, you know, QED and QCD and other stuff is very rich because you have all these infinite dimensional symmetries, but also very subtle uh, because the subtlety comes back, uh, trace back to, to precisely providing uh, good boundary conditions and actually trying to disentangle which things are genuine uh, physical effects are sustained and observables, and think that are somehow a, um, an artifact of the gauge fixing or the boundary condition that, that you want to impose. So all these things are, is, is very um, uh, subtle and is still uh, investigated right now. As I said, we don't know what are the full symmetries of uh, quantum gravity in, in, in asymptotically flat space-time. And uh, this really what motivated uh, the quest for uh, celestial holography. Because, you know, people started to think of that as soon, I guess, as they, s they found this trust answer. Because before there was this, um, this, uh, an uh, this um, equivalence with uh, super translation symmetry, but as soon as people understood that you could allow for super rotations and that you had the full VRSR symmetry acting on that, they thought, ah, okay, this starts really to smell good. Maybe we can actually apply the machinery of CFT to, to get some stuff on the dual theory. And then all this thing uh, escalated and, and it came with this change of basis, this melon transform, and this is how all the story uh, appeared. Um, and to recall the main idea of uh, celestial holography is that uh, basically uh, quantum gravity in uh, 4D, flat space, can be uh, encoded into a celestial uh, two-dimensional uh, field theory. So again, this word celestial is meant there to say, okay, it lives on the celestial sphere. Um, so it's called dimension two kind of holography, but also it's not really a CFT two. Um, and actually I don't think it is, and I don't think it should be because, you know, this, this is very different. We have a very different, important difference with ADS CFT holography that we are allowing for fluxes out escape out algorithm radiation as Adrien uh, mentioned in his talk, is, this is a thing that we do not you do usually in ADS-CFT. Uh, and that's why we have, I think, all this uh, nice uh, control. But, um, but if you want to uh, come up with a holographic dictionary for flat space-time, we have to include outgoing uh, radiation. And therefore, all the problems come. But this is a good thing uh, because 
it really forces us to address this holographic principle beyond the, the canonical cases and the, the things that, that are under control. So we want to, probably we will learn uh, new things about, about um, you know, uh, what this, this, this theory should look like. Um, it's not guaranteed that uh, we will achieve a sort of uh, full description of, uh, from, from this side, but so far the idea is that follow the symmetry, uh, trust yourself and then see what it gives and we start to pile up a, a, a list of, of, of properties for, for this dual theory. Um, and precisely, um, so we have somehow a new holographic feature, we have a promise, promising dictionary uh, given by the Melin transform. And um, we have uh, seen that very different from EDS because we have uh, uh, this escape of radiation. Um, so the outlook is that the thing that we should do in this program is, <laughs> I guess, understand or at least uh, understand this, um, answer this question. What is a celestial th a CFT? Uh, namely, uh, at least give a list of properties or axiom that this thing has to obey or uh, to give, that would be a great thing, to give um, at least a, in a, a toy model of a celestial CFT, so an intrinsic definition of such a theory that is somehow, uh, you know, so far we have been doing that, inferring from uh, when we know in the bulk what the CSR safety has to obey, but we also want to go the other way around. And that's the outstanding challenge, I would say, of this program is, is, is to do that. Um, and um, there are many other interesting things one can wonder uh, is whether, to which extent, this CC CLFT has to do uh, with the string theory and the string worksheet, so this is, there have been some papers on that, uh, understanding better this connection. And, um, and finally, something that uh, I am personally very interested in is at the end of the day, <laughs> we would like to understand how this program can tell us about black holes. So put black holes in the game, see whether um, this uh, celestial picture, this is a very ambitious goal, but at the end, we, we, we do not want always to, we also want to learn something new about black hole information. We have this, this symmetry that constrains in principle black hole formation and evaporation, uh, but there is a lot of work uh, left to do. Um, so I think I will stop here, so thanks a lot uh, for listening. Okay, thank you very nice, uh, very nice talk. <laughs> okay, do we have any other observation? We had already a few questions, but maybe we can do it a bit more. Observations or questions? Anyone? I, I remember reading the paper on uh, uh, mm, OP not OP coefficient, OP expansion and obtaining it from mapping uh, um, the, the um, collinear uh, limits of amplitudes. And I remember there was an issue with signature there, uh, if I remember well, that one needs to take split signature to, to map properly the OP limit. Is that right? Or could you comment on that perhaps? Yes. Yes. So this body of literature is, yeah. It's on my own, but I, I can give, give some, uh, some comments on that. Uh, so the, the OP of, of, um, of uh, say, of, of Graviton has been computed by uh, a number of people, so there are two ways you can do that. Uh, as Emilio said, you can either start by um, taking, uh, take, if you take the collinear limit, as you said, uh, which actually amounts to take the point that I'm explaining for everybody that the point that 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 uh, on the celestial sphere to be uh, 
to coincide. And then you Merlin transform this. So take your favorite amplitude and do that. This is what Stieberg and Taylor have, have been doing. And they have uh, derived the OPRI like that. Let's call it the brute force way. Or you can uh, compute in a different way by asking for consistency with symmetries. And this is what uh, Strominger, Pedro Clario, and, and Guevara and others have, have been doing. And you, you find that it's uh, nicely the symmetry fix the P coefficients and give you a little bit of function and stuff. So this has been done. Now, um, I think the, the, the literature you might have in mind has to do precisely with this, uh, with this infinite tower of currents. Actually, all this work was taken from the um, uh, OPE uh, result that I mentioned before. So the OPE things were, were done for different helicity stuff. So, but uh, this recasting in terms of a W1 plus infinity uh, algebra, this, this uh, more recent piece of literature, were um, done for all plus helicity, uh, only all, all, either all plus helicity or all minus helicity. And to some extent, this is related to, to requiring the, the to working, it is related to the split signature and stuff. And there is also a very nice uh, interpretation of this uh, celestial uh, story and, and currents and W uh, infinity algebra from people coming from Twister space, the Twister space community. So Atul Sharma, Adam Mason and, and company. And in Twister space somehow this is naturally, there is some connection with the split signature and stuff. And, um, they have been able to rederive this result from a you know, totally different picture, which I think is very nice because, again, it's again a new community that is uh, going in the game and tracing back to our old work of Penrose uh, and stuff. So, yeah, so this, there are some pieces of literature that, that are working in speed signature uh, for some results. Yeah. Thanks, Laura, for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on massive, uh, massive particles, because they are kind of not reaching infinity, so where should be, I mean, where are they in the celestial picture? I mean, is there yes. a proposal or something? Uh? Yeah. So, indeed, this is an important aspect that we didn't touch on, mostly because, mostly because it's, 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 the story is, fully, is less fully developed, but many things carry through. Uh, so in this case, the main difference is that instead of doing the Mellin transform that uh, Emilio talked about, you will do a more complicated integral which involves the bulk to boundary propagator. So it's just the, the map of the dictionary is a little bit more intricate than, than that. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the massive case uh, is more tricky because, I mean, as you know, I mean, there's this asymptotic symmetry business at time like infinity is a bit uh, less under control, uh, but there have been a nice paper by Campili and Lada on that, uh, and yeah. But so could you see them in your picture somewhere? I mean, would be which kind of, I mean, would be some operators, like which they are kind of strange object or like, or you have complete, I don't know, like you have. Yeah, no, they should correspond to, I guess, some sort of, uh, yeah, um, other, yeah, different limits from this uh, now not Mellin transform, okay. but this uh, bulk to boundary uh, correspondence thing. I, 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 I don't know exactly what, what you will get because it's not something I, I looked at, it was not looked at so much. Uh, but, um, but, but yeah, I think this is, this is under development, so it's, okay, not, it's, it's not fully understood, yeah. But there are many things that work and something that were not covered. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, I never heard, of, I mean, yeah, I heard, but I never studied the memory effect. Can you uh, maybe elaborate a little bit? Because uh, to me, it seems very extremely strange. So first, uh, first of all, the question is, is something specific only to like to the wave, uh, gravitational waves, or is something really, really deep about, there is something deep about gravity? I mean, this kind of dissipation, because I mean, this loss of information or additional information it depends on how you want to to look at it. It seems very strange that you know if you do an ex experiment here, somehow you can uh, detect that I went to the bathroom 30 uh, minutes ago, right? So I the, mean, the memory effect. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, this is, it's pretty, uh, this is pretty remarkable if you think of that. This, 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 uh, this effect, I mean, the, the implication of this effect are kind of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, crazy. It means, yeah, have this, this the events are desynchronized for, for you and me when you will have a gravitational wave passing and stuff. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty deep stuff. There is some analogous uh, effect of that. So I think your question was about uh, is it special to, to gravity? There is, you see, <coughs> all these uh, columns <laughs> carry on for more theory than gravity. So I, I sketched the uh, uh, gauge theory case for abelian theory, but there is also a non abelian version of that. There is also a supersymmetric version of that. And to which, to which cases there is supposed to be, this is this infrared. Uh, Big picture of Strominger. He has a book about about, about the, this relation, this triangle between atomic symmetries, where, uh, sub theorems, and memory effects. And so the idea is this would be that each triangle should carry on, regardless of the theory. That is a new universal feature of the infrastructure of of uh, gauge theories and, and 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 gravity. And that in each case you have an analogous, uh, you have a memory effect that is encoded. Now the, the nature of this memory effect, the way to understand it, is more tricky uh, for gauge theory and also for uh, subleading cases. You have also a memory effect, or spin memory effect, or um, there are actually several kinds of, of um, analysis about that, uh, but that's, that's, that's the idea. So the hope is this uh, first, uh, on the experimental perspective, uh, detection of the, um, the one associated to leading uh, uh, symmetries, support transformation, will be measured very soon. And then there are the other ones, there are predictions of how to, me to measure them, uh, even for uh, gauge theories. So it's supposed to be universal stuff. And, yeah. uh, but can you make a, maybe an, an example of memory effect in gauge theories? I mean, so what should I think of uh, a concrete very simple-minded example. Um, <laughs> it it would sound like you know <laughs> the memory effect associated to the to the U1 case is easy to understand, but actually uh, pretty confusing. And the experimental setup to, for detecting that there are some people by Lena Lenisaskin and Sabrina Parsterski about that, uh, but. Um, it's, 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 it's pretty tricky. I mean, we can talk about that, and there is also a, the gluon the gluon analysis. There is some um, some proposal of measuring. Uh, I don't remember where, but we can we can discuss about, sure. about that. I guess I have Thank less you. intuition on that. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Maybe we have time for one more question, if it's quick. <laughs> maybe. Ah. Very quick. Yeah, very quickly, you mentioned string theory in the worksheet about connections with uh, with it. I yes. can briefly comment on this, like how people are addressing this thing with, from a worksheet perspective. Yeah, that's what people are being trying to to see that you can, for instance, recover the OPE from a worksheet computation, the OPE coefficient, uh, the OPE uh, relation of celestial CFT. There's been some paper by uh, Stieberger, Taylor, and and more recent also, uh, and they manage, I think, to to recover the OP uh, coefficient from, from this point of view. So, yeah, that's, that's the same. It's, there is not a lot of paper yet on this, on this I have to say. So I it's, see. Uh, yeah. OK. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. Would be like, you know, to which extent the, at the end we will find that the only consistent <laughs> theory is <laughs> so like the string theory. And so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Massimo, I don't hear. Not quite sure what has been done on that. This is not something I worked on. Uh, yeah. Maybe he wants to. Maybe you give him the. I would say that, I mean, convergence of the OPE. It's easy to understand when you have some nice Hilbert space interpretation. So if you have some nice radial quantization, yeah. for example, everything like follows through, very easily. However. <laughs> In this case, it's uh, tough to actually uh, find uh, this uh, 
I mean, the, the usual Hilbert space picture of a CFT is a bit uh, hidden. Yeah, th 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 there are some attempts. In, in particular, w once you do like a shadow transform of, let's say, out states, then you, you can get some uh, interpretation like uh, radial quantization, and then you can try to rephrase what you know in usual CFTs, and then you may try to say that, okay, uh, in the end, the, the OP is just expanding a state in, in the Hilbert space. There, yeah, there has been some, some, yeah, yeah there, by, there's uh, this some, work, yeah, yeah by, by Strominger yeah. and, and other some kind people. of uh, steps towards this direction. Yeah. So, so, I mean, here the problem is mostly that, uh, let's say, once you write a two point function, it looks like a, a delta function. So, it, it's the way one does uh, the, the typical. Uh, Radial quantization is when once you have a power law, you, you define, let's say, in and out state, you send the out state with this, I don't know, z to the power to delta or something on that kind of reasoning and the other state is at zero or on the vacuum. But if you use the, this with the, the state defined from the S matrix, the S matrix, the in and out states are delta function normalized. And so you, you cannot just send one to zero or the other in to infinity, it, just, it gives you zero. So that, that's not a good <laughs> definition. Uh, or the, the thing to do is to smear it. So you, if you smear it against uh, like doing the shadow transform, then you get the power law and then you get uh, the, the usual story. So that's the kind of intuition. But it's, it's a bit, uh, uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, counterintuitive. I don't know if this was helpful, maybe. Yeah, that's why I wanted to talk about the shadow transform because it might seem like a technicality, but actually it's very crucial in order to, it's, it's a very important ingredient if we want to, to, to do this kind of uh, things, so yeah. Okay, very nice. Maybe yeah. with this discussion we can, <laughs> we can leave it for dinner, maybe. Okay, let's thank our speakers again. I think now we should give a huge round of applause for all the organizers for putting this conference uh, together. <laughs>